Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God. Welcome to those who are joining us in live streaming. So to begin as usual, we have uh, take a look at the announcements for this week and the upcoming Lord's Days. Um, are there any announcements to be added or clarifications to be made? There are not. Okay, are there any items for prayer, praise, or thanksgiving? John Happel will be praying today. Yes, Siobhan. Okay, Javon's uh, mother came out of the hospital on Monday. So we give thanks for that. Mike. Okay. Okay, so the, the Kellys are down with a cold and Mike's dad has a stomach virus. Pray for healing. Yes, Grace. Okay. Is that sending a message to me? I, I, I keep going back and forth to Massachusetts, so uh, Grace, Grace Scott, I actually I don't understand what that means, but you don't have to, you're doing an internship or something that, I got one locally, that's better, okay. Mm -hmm. And I still have to go to Massachusetts. Anything else? Heidi. Um, Lydia and George are also home sick today. We were praying that George might be allowed by the judge to come here for Christmas. Okay. Um, we prayed for Lydia and George to be able to come to Christmas. Okay. All right. Lydia and, and, and George are home sick today, and they're praying that the, the judge will allow them to come from Rhode Island uh, here for Christmas. Aaron. This coming Saturday. All right. Okay. John Happel's birthday is coming up on Saturday. Jen. Okay. Okay. So Greg's not feeling well. Yes. Um, For, for where? Ecuador. Did you get that? Ecuador? Man. Is this a mission trip or? I'll go back to Massachusetts. All right, so Becca's parents are retiring too. The equator. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, let's take a few moments now to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship this morning is found in the bulletin from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever and ever. Amen. Our opening psalm that I chose for this morning, Psalm 119a, comprises the first eight verses of this psalm, as we know, the longest in the Bible of 176 verses. That is divided into 22 stanzas of eight verses each in an alphabetic acrostic. 
following the Hebrew alphabet. The entire psalm is a meditation on the excellencies of God's word. I think that's an appropriate way to summarize it. That's from the heading in my New King James Version. The first four verses of the entire psalm, which we'll sing this morning, uh, these verses speak of God's people in general. Blessed are those, blessed um, your precepts you have given to us. But then starting in verse 5, which is the second half of stanza 2 in our Psalters, in the, in the first selection, the psalmist begins to speak personally to the Lord. May all my ways be firmly fixed, for I will not be put to shame. And the first person singular continues through the remaining 172 verses of the psalm. So it becomes a personal dialogue between the psalmist and the Lord, displaying the true working of the heart of faith. And by the way, I have most of what I have here on our selection is taken from either O. Palmer Robertson or from Professor Williams at our seminary. So we begin this personal dialogue. And in verse 5, we see we have a deep desire of the psalmist to grow closer to the Lord. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep, my sta to keep your statutes. The child of God must want holiness. This verse shows what our chief want should be. We need to pray for the will to obey. When we think about the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, we should want to walk in his statutes. But now skipping from verse 5 to the last verse of the selection, verse 8, we go from wanting to obey, from expressing the desire to obey and asking God for that desire, because only God can give us that desire, to actually obeying. As our Psalters put it, I'll keep, I will, I'll keep your statutes faithfully. That's the first half of that verse. But I'd like to focus on the second half of that verse uh, because it relates to our Psalm of the Week, actually, Psalm 88, and you'll see how in a bit. In the final words of this selection of the psalm, the psalmist cries, do not forsake me utterly. Now note, that the psalmist does not say, do not forsake me. He says, do not forsake me utterly. The word for utterly in Hebrew means very much. So we could translate it, do not forsake me very much, or perhaps do not forsake me permanently, forever. That's the sense of it here, according to Professor Williams. And this brings us back to the whole messianic side of Psalm 119 and how we can and should hear these words as the words of Christ. God has promised not to forsake his people ever. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Who is the one faithful man that God did forsake? His own son. But God did not forsake him forever. When he hung on the cross to bear God's wrath for our sins, in that moment, he was forsaken by God. As we know Christ's words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are not forsaken because Jesus was forsaken for us, but not utterly, because he rose on the third day and is seated at the right hand of the Father, having won for us victory over sin and death, and having given us eternal life. What greater reason could we have to desire to obey his precepts and to worship him in truth? It is with that heartfelt thanks that we sing this psalm. So please stand, if you are able, and praise God by singing Psalm 119a, and then please remain standing as we ask God's blessing on our worship. Pray. 
Let's pray. Almighty and merciful God, we give you thanks for all your goodness and tender mercies, especially for the gift of your dear Son and for the revelation of your will and grace. We thank you for the promise of Psalm 119a that as you redeemed, you will never leave us nor forsake us because our Lord Jesus Christ was forsaken for a time to pay the penalty for our sins. During this hour of worship, O Lord, draw us closer to you through the reading and preaching of the word and the singing of your psalms in the light of Christ's finished work. May we be truly thankful for all your blessings, praising you not only with our lips but with our minds as well, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. So our psalm of the week, Psalm 88b, covers the second half of the psalm, and most of you, I believe, are already familiar with this psalm after Pastor Aaron's introduction last week and the discussion of it before that in Bible study, at least as I understand it. The second half of the psalm is a continuation of the theme of the first half. It is a gloomy, dark, depressing text of despair. I would call it the saddest psalm in the whole Psalter, which makes it the saddest psalm in the saddest and shortest book of the Psalter, book three, which includes Psalms 73 to to 89. And I'll quote from Robertson, book three raises the dark specter of international armies who devastate David's dynasty and the Lord's dwelling place at the temple in Jerusalem. And it is also to note one of the few individualistic Psalms in book three, which mostly deal with the corporate nation of Israel and its devastation in both the Northern and Southern kingdoms. The psalmist is near death. It comes out in almost every verse. He's overcome by it, obsessed by it. So why did Pastor Brian Coombs preach from this psalm for an Easter sermon about 10 years ago? Precisely because there's something even grayer here than the grave. God has abandoned the psalmist. He's not answering his prayers because he's angry with him. So he's leaving him in his woe. The psalm ends in utter darkness. The psalmist has been forsaken. As our Psalter puts it, and this is the very end, by you I am of all my friends bereft, and those who love me are in darkness left. Which means, of course, and I think you can anticipate what I'm going to say, that this psalm can only be about Jesus Christ, who, as you recall from verse 8 of Psalm 119, was forsaken for a time to pay the penalty for our sins. This is a preview of the life, and this is from Pastor Coombs, this is a preview of the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He endured all manner of affliction from his youth up, yet never for his own sins. Finally, the full fury and weight of God rests, rested on him on the cross. Jesus is the one who takes us from death to life, who crosses the bridge. Only Christ was forsaken by his Father for a time so that we will never be forsaken. Which is why, and this is not from Pastor Coombs, this is for me, which is why this psalm cannot be about God's elect, But we also know that Christ is alive, which is why when we come to the final psalm of book 3, verse 89, we can sing along with Jesus, verses 1 to 4. Remember this now, 89, which will begin next week, is the final psalm of the darkest book. Yet it begins this way. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. 
I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now, of course, the Psalms were arranged not haphazardly, and there's a reason for this. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Christ has experienced Psalm 88 for us. Psalm 88 is about Jesus. Since Christ has died and risen for sinners, if you believe in him, you will not undergo this death, the death you deserve and that he underwent. He underwent all the agony and darkness of Psalm 88. Just as with Psalm 119 that we sang earlier, we can and should sing these words as the words of Christ. We are not forsaken because Christ was forsaken for us. When you are weighed down, you can flee, and this is, this is back to Brian Coombs. I'm taking this from him. You can flee to Psalm 88 and sing it with great comfort, knowing that this psalm ends at the cross when Jesus said it is finished and that Psalm 89 will dawn for us as it did for Jesus. If you sing this psalm from the perspective of Jesus Christ, who wrote it, sang it, and lived it for us, then it becomes true joy. What can you fear if God no longer has a case against you? Nothing. There's everything to rejoice in. Sing this psalm as one alive from the dead. God wants us to sing this. He gave us this song. We are singing the fruit of Christ's suffering. We sing this in the hope of the resurrection, not in the prospect of death. Whenever you feel the effects of sin, the weight of the curse, then sing this psalm in the knowledge that Christ died for sinners, and therefore you have eternal life. So please stand if you are able and sing Psalm 88, Selection darkness 
If you'd please turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Today we'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 6 and the topic of holiness. We began looking at Isaiah chapter 6 at Bible study on Thursday. We uh, looked at verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Uh, we looked at King Uzziah and how uh, this is important to understand the, the throne room vision that Isaiah receives. So the king of Israel has died. That's whom uh, Isaiah or Uzziah was. He was one of the descendants of David and Solomon. And he uh, dies as the king of Israel. And now Isaiah is in the, the throne room of the, the king of Israel. And uh, we looked at Second Chronicles chapter 26. And Uzziah was a, a good king, uh, except for one small thing. Um, he ended up going into the temple where the Levites were only permitted to go. And Uzziah tried to offer up uh, from coals from the altar and incense on those coals, something that only the Levitical priests were to do according to God's holy commandments. And uh, there were uh, many brave Levites that tried to prevent Uzziah the king from doing that. Uh, eventually, it was God that prevented Uzziah from offering up this strange fire, and Uzziah was struck for the rest of his life with leprosy on his forehead. He was unclean. And that is how his life ends in Second Chronicles chapter 26. He is separated from society. So his son had to begin reigning for him. I'm not sure how many years he uh, had this leprosy on his forehead. He was no longer able to go to the house of the Lord to worship because he was unclean. And um, he was like a, a leper. And it's this background that is helpful for understanding now Isaiah, who is not in the temple, the earthly temple. He's in the very presence of the Lord. And Isaiah was a contemporary of King Uzziah. And of course, Isaiah knew what happened to King Uzziah. Uh, but now Isaiah finds himself in the very presence and the reality of God's holiness. So I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 6. Hear the living word of the living God. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, and two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask now and thank you, Father, for the sending forth of your Son, Jesus, 
And we thank you for your sitting now as our prophet, priest, and king, having accomplished the work of redemption. We thank you that you now sit at the right hand of God the Father. If Uzziah could not go into the earthly temple and the precinct, precincts and to or even the high priest and to the holy of holies but once for a year and after having made atonement for his own sin we thank you and praise you jesus that you are our great high priest who is holy and innocent and undefiled and separated from sinners and we pray that you would grant your spirit and we pray that through your spirit you would give us the eyes of faith to see more clearly the beauty the glory of your holiness to understand that, that we have been made to image your holiness. And I pray that the, the Spirit would not allow us to, um, to harden our hearts or to be deaf and to, to stop our ears. We pray that you would give us understanding and that our, our response would be the response of praise and worship and adoration uh, today, but throughout all of our life and that you would be glorified, your holiness would be reflected in our lives. And may we remember and hear your word and believe it, that without sanctification, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So help us to see you, Jesus, and help give us eyes now as we hear your word. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. So this morning we'll be looking at the attribute of God's holiness and we'll be looking at what makes holiness distinctive to Christianity, uh, all people. This is a part of who you are, and we'll be looking at that, whether or not you're in Christ. Uh, we do image God. Um, even after the fall, that's part of being made in the image of God. We are made in, in holiness. What makes holiness distinctive to Christianity is Jesus, who is now at the right hand of God the Father, as our great high priest, and as our king. And then we'll be spending most of the, the sermon looking at uh, an angle of how holiness is overlooked, um, but it's all around us um, in the world in which we live. But it's important for us as we consider holiness, and again, everyone has their own, uh, their own personal space, their own personal time, um, their own privacy. Uh, these are aspects and working out of, of holiness, but it's very important that as we think about our own lives and our own holiness, that we do so looking at Christ. Um, that, that is, he is our, our holiness, he is our righteousness, he is our, our redemption. Um, but everyone, whether or not they're looking at Christ, they, they have some kind of, um, something that they sanctify, things that they hold sacred. And, and what happens is that fallen man holds sacred that which is unholy, that which God hates. We, and that's why we harden our hearts, because we don't want God to touch my space. I don't want God to touch my thoughts. God has no say in what I look at. So instead of gazing at the beauty and the glory of God's holiness, fallen man, we, we, we take our gaze and we, we turn our back on, on God, and, and we, we look at other things. That's, that's what John means in John 1 when he says that men loved darkness. The love of darkness is, is holiness, but it's holiness perverted. It, it's holiness looking at what is, is ugly and disgusting. And, and when you try to sh shine light on the unholiness and the darkness of men, they hate it. And, and that's what will happen to Isaiah. You would think that people and God's people would be excited. Oh, Isaiah has seen the Lord. Isaiah's lips have been touched by the altar of God. The holy fire of God is now on his lips and his heart. I can't wait to hear what he will say. It's just the opposite. It's not that God's people weren't interested in their own forms of idolatry and holiness, but they, they, they wanted nothing to do with the holiness of God. So we'll be looking at all of these things, and I, I pray that in this that we would understand and see more clearly the holiness in our own society and, and your own personal holiness and whether or not your personal holiness is measured up by the holiness of God and the holiness of his law. So we, we tend to think that holiness belongs to the sphere of religion, um, and it does, but everything is religious. All of life is religious. Um, but if you were to do a Google, a Google search, which I did, and you can do a Google search on holiness, and you can look at all the news articles in the last week or last couple of months, um, if you were to Google holiness, you would come up with 
articles about um, the Pope, the Dalai Lama, how Christmas is a time to be holy and righteous, uh, the light of Hanukkah in our soul. President Biden met last month with his All Holiness, ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. Um, and, and what you'll see in, in all of this, um, in these articles, the news stories on, on holiness, is we tend to make a complete uh, distinction between the sacred and the secular. Uh, we are told that holiness is off limits for public life and law. And this is one of the ways in which we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The reality is that our society has more laws rooted in holiness than ancient Israel had in the book of Leviticus. Now as we begin to think, and I know some of you are frowning like, no, the book of Leviticus has a lot of holy laws, and yeah, and we have even more. And if, and if you don't see that, it, it's all around us. And we, we live in a very holy society. But to the extent that our society is holy and it's turned its back on God, this is actually very oppressive. And you begin to realize where that oppression is coming from. Uh, and the freedom then comes through Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who has made atonement for our sins. So in the Old Covenant, that atonement was signified by the altar that the, one of the angelic beings took and cleansed Isaiah's lips with, and, and all of us need to be cleansed by the atoning work of Jesus, the Holy One of Israel. So as we think about what is holiness, holiness is an attribute of God. It's one of the first things we teach our children in the Shorter Catechism when we teach our children what is God. And hopefully, my young friends, you know by now that God is a spirit who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. God's holiness is one of the first things that Jesus taught us to pray, or we teach our children to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's what hallowed be thy name as we are praying that the name of God, his name which is praised by the seraphim, his title, Adonai, Lord, which is praised, his glory, which is praised, is part of his name, uh, the whole earth, all of his works reflect his, his holiness. This is the, the name of God. This is what you're praying for. This is probably, I hope, one of the prayers you've prayed most in your life. And, and this is what you are asking, that God's name would be hallowed and that his will would be done, his holy will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's why Isaiah was sent. That's why the church is commissioned. So God has revealed his holiness. He has revealed his holy will. He has revealed uh, his, his moral law and, and, and Christ's perfect obedience. And this is what we are to make known to the ends of the earth. Uh, God's holiness was a, very much a part of Old Covenant worship, just as it is in New Covenant worship. In fact, I, don't, I won't answer the question this morning, but you might ask, how, how do we as a congregation in our worship reflect the holiness of God? Uh, that We're all about the, the holiness of God. It's very central to what makes a true church a, a church, is God's holiness. It's not just the proclamation of his word, but that his, his holiness is reflected in our worship in spirit and truth. In the Old Covenant, remember Jesus taught that he was greater than the temple in Matthew chapter 12. Well, in the Old Covenant, as you think about the tabernacle of Moses and how Moses went up Mount Sinai, the holiness, the trembling of the mountain, like the trembling uh, in the temple as the, the seraphim are crying out, uh, their, their voice, as it were, causes the foundations of heaven, if, if there were some, to, to shake. And, and it is the, the, that beauty, and that beauty then was reflected in the tabernacle and the temple that Uzziah's great-great-great-great-grandfather Solomon had built. You see holiness in the priests, in the priesthood, the high priest. Uh, as the, the high priest in some of his ministrations, when he went into the, the temple, there was a particular kind of turban that he would wear on his head, and on it was inscribed, Holy to the Lord. I think that's one of the reasons why the forehead of Isaiah was struck. He was unholy to the Lord. He, he transgressed one of the barriers of God. And that's a very important uh, for our understanding what is holiness. Uh, holiness includes, it, it's not only that, but it's a transgressing and it is going beyond something that God says you shall not go across this boundary. Uh, you shall not eat from this tree. Uh, you shall... Um, Keep my name holy. Uh, 
Uh, you shall remember the Sabbath day and sanctify it. You shall honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. And when you begin to transgress these, these barriers, that is when you're sinning against God and you are sinning against his holiness. And of course, in the, the temple itself, you had a, a place called the holy place where the Levites were allowed to minister. And beyond that, you had the veil and the curtain, the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, representing God's throne. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the law, the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. And that is where atonement needed to be made by the high priest. And that's why you have smoke coming up here in Isaiah chapter 6, because the only time the high priest could go in was on the Day of Atonement, but it was only when he took coals from the altar and placed incense on it and that uh, produced the the smoke um, in the very holy of holies <clears throat> and and understanding this is very important for understanding uh, the new covenant as well and the finished work of jesus remember when jesus died on the cross that veil in the temple my understanding is that it was the veil that separated the holy of holies from the holy place that veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying that that way into God's holy, blessed presence is through the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus because of his perfect obedience and his being forsaken. As Charles reminded us, not utterly forsaken. He was vindicated on the first day of the week. There is no other way back into the presence of God. All of us have transgressed God's law. We have all fallen short of his glory um, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. So there's sanctification, there's holiness. It's in Christ Jesus. Saints by calling. Every Christian is a saint. It's not based on our obedience or our works. It's based on the finished work of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So what happens in the new covenant is that the Holy Spirit writes the law of God, the moral law of God, on our heart. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the great commandments of the Old and New, New Testament, you might remember from Peter, as obedient children do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And Peter, of course, is quoting from the book of Leviticus, and that is one of the refrains that you'll find in the book of Leviticus, be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. God has set us apart in Jesus to be holy in life, to be holy in worship, according to his law, and in the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Holiness is not something that we can make up. Holiness is objective. It is objective because it is an attribute of God. He is holy, holy, holy. Now, to my knowledge, and again, as, as we think, you know, what, what makes holiness distinctive, and we've already mentioned it's to Christianity, it is Jesus. It is the person and work of of Jesus. Everyone is talking about holy and holiness and holy nights and sacred days and, and there it's all over. It doesn't really matter as far any religion that I know of. There's some kind of sacred, there's some kind of holy, uh, whatever any society, any nation, uh, you have an emphasis on holiness in various ways. But what, what is distinctive to Christianity in our text is it's the altar. It is the, the, everything that the uh, tabernacle and the temple represented. It's the person and work of Christ, who is the unblemished lamb, without spot. He is, as Hebrews 13 verse 10 says, Jesus is our altar. It is only through faith in Jesus that we can be brought near to God. Um, another thing that makes uh, holiness distinctive related to the person and work of Jesus is the biblical teaching that the glory that the seraphim are worshiping as they, as they worship the Lord in verse 1, Adonai, as they worship Yahweh of hosts in verse 3, as they worship the king in verse 5, 
Um, and, and, and this is how Isaiah responds. My eyes have seen the king, Yahweh of hosts. If you turn with me in John's gospel, and John's gospel is a gospel of glory and the revelation of Jesus' glory. And we looked at this at a Bible study on Thursday, but it's important for you to keep in mind as we think about the distinctiveness and holiness. The, Jesus is the only way, in other words. He is the truth, the life. There, no one can come to the Father except through Jesus. And, and this is where a lot of p- religious people get it wrong. A lot of religious people think that if they, they have particular sacred objects and sacred things that they make up in their own imagination, that somehow they, they can then uh, approach a holy God. The only way you can approach a holy God is through Jesus. That, that is the only way that the lips of Isaiah could be sanctified and made holy is through that altar. It's God's provision for the prophet's sin. And the prophet then will proclaim not just the judgment of God, but God's provision for our sin through God's judgment uh, upon his son, Jesus Christ. But John says in John chapter 12 and verses 37 through 41 that Jesus performed so many signs before the Jews, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory, and he spoke of him. So whose whose glory does Isaiah see? Isaiah sees Jesus. Jesus is the Holy One of Israel. He is the one that the Apostle John saw on the Lord's Day. You have the the holiness of God the Father's throne uh, in Revelation chapter 4. That angelic uh, cherubim are worshiping God as holy, holy, holy. Um, and they do that day and night. And then in Revelation 5, the incarnate Christ who is overcome, he ascends, and he is the one who is worthy to take the scroll, and he is the one then that sits at the right hand of God the Father as the one who is both God and man, the one who is, Jesus eternally has been worshipped by, uh, and Jesus is eternally uh, holy and glorious. And ever since the angelic beings were, were made, the angelic beings would worship Uh, the triune God, for God's holiness. But now in in Christ's redemptive work as the son of David, the son of Solomon, the son of Uzziah, who was not holy, um, Jesus, though, is the Holy One of God. He has sat down, and now he is worshipped by all creation, the God-man as the one who is holy. And so this is whom Isaiah sees. And, and this is the, the great mystery of the gospel, isn't it? That the one whom Isaiah sees in Isaiah chapter 6, the Holy One of Israel, that, and he, uh, he's conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Yeah, that's Isaiah chapter 7. And, that, and, and the Holy One of Israel, through whom all things were, were made, uh, through whom and, and that creation, that the glory of the Lord is manifested in creation, the very creator and all of his glory, including his attribute of holiness, he would reveal that divine glory and he would reveal it through his humiliation. He would reveal it through his obedience. He would reveal the glory of God's justice and, and holiness and love for his people through Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, that, that, is the, that is the great wonder, that is the great mystery of the incarnation. The very Holy One of Israel, the eternal Son of God, um, it, uh, becomes and is made like, in every way like we are, yet as without sin, so that we might be brought near to God. You, you cannot approach God in any other way than through faith in Jesus. So what other, other ways people invent uh, for their, their holy trinkets and whatever they carry around or whatever kind of clothing they wear you must be clothed in the righteousness of Christ alone. There, there is no other holiness to be found than Jesus. We all do have our own ideas of holiness, but what happens is that it, people turn their back on the finished work, that they turn their back on the ascended Christ, and then they invent their own holiness. But they do so with their back turned to the finished work of Christ. And that holiness is really darkness. But people cherish it like it's, it's very personal to them. 
um, <clears throat> how did God create man? Is, is, and, and, I wanna, and this is what I want us to begin thinking about because we, we tend to think of holiness as just merely like something you do on church or something that, I don't know, other religions do on, on their, their holy days and their, their holy ground. Um, all of us are made in the image of God. Question 10 of the Shorter Catechism asks, how did God create man? And, and uh, God created man male and female after his own image and knowledge and righteousness and holiness with dominion over the creatures. So we are, we are made in the, the image of God, and holiness is, is part of that. Now you might say, well, how does mankind image God and knowledge in society, right? And, and how do we see the bigger picture of this in the world in which we live? Uh, well, academic institutions, right? How many, many of you are students or teachers? Um, knowledge is a very important part of our lives. Righteousness, dealing with things like justice, uh, law, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, we see the, the image of God. It's, it's certainly, def it's, sin has affected it so that our knowledge and our, our, our laws don't reflect the law of God as it ought to. That, that's part of our witness and our testimony. But the very fact that we are uh, a society of law and other societies have their laws, it's, it's because of the image of God in man. And initially, you might think that holiness, though, is not a very big deal. You might be thinking, well, how do I see holiness? Um, this is only, you know, for religious people. Um, so we, we make this, as I already mentioned, this distinction between the holy and the profane. But when you begin to think about what holiness is, holiness is the uh, attempt to preserve in some way something that we think is whole and ought to be protected. Um, I, our, our persons, we have laws that will protect our persons, the integrity of our children, um, other spaces and times. Uh, this is a reflection of God and his holiness. COVID-19 and what our government does has its roots in holiness. In fact, there are many parallels between COVID-19. So this affects every day. So I'm just picking one thing that's affected the last, I don't know, year and a half, two years. Um, but it parallels the Levitical purity laws um, that, that you find in the third book of the Bible. What is clean and who is unclean? And we, we make judgments based on uh, ceremonial washings and distances, right? You, so. Um, so you, you maintain, uh, here's what our society is attempting to do anyway, you want to maintain health uh, of society, wholeness, uh, purity, and you want it to, to protect it from a particular kind of virus. And so what do we do? Well, we close our nation's borders to international travelers. You're unholy, you're unclean, you cannot come near to us. You keep your dis That's what holiness is. This is an outworking of holiness. It's all around us. We close our schools. We meet on Zoom because you are or other people are unclean. We have curfews, lockdowns, quarantines. We have signs all around letting us know where we can stand and, and what six feet apart is. And I think some of those feet aren't even six feet. I think they're like eight or ten feet, some of those signs. And, and then we're told what direction we can walk in stores. You, you can't walk this way, you have to walk this way in order to maintain your distance and purity. That's holiness. We hear over and over again people saying, no, this is science, 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 you know, knowledge. Um, but it's, no, it's holiness run amok. The protection of others and removing from society whom we perceive to be threats. And it's so not only holiness run amok because of all of the mandates that we see, but it would be better to die 1,000 COVID deaths than to die in your sin. And, and as terrible as getting, and I am not in any way downplaying the seriousness of getting sick by COVID. I don't want to get sick with that. But I would rather, and if you understand anything about God and his holiness, it would be far better to die 1,000 times of COVID than once in your sin. And this is what Isaiah will, will speak, but, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sin is hidden his face from you. Our society doesn't care at all about sin. But that's what we as Christians should care about, the holiness of God. 
Yes, our health is important, but our society seems to care nothing about the law of God. And this is a burden that we all bear in this fallen and sin-cursed world. When people begin to turn that image of God and they turn away from God and Jesus and his moral law, and they begin to define holiness in other ways without respect to God's Ten Commandments. Another example of holiness is in creation and the kinds of feelings creation can evoke in people, a sense of worship and reverence and awe that stirs within us. And you don't have to be a Christian to have these feelings of reverence and awe. Um, The real question is, what do you do with these feelings of reverence and awe for creation? Do you look to the creator and to the redeemer in the hope of the new heavens and the new earth, or do you look away and do you look at other things like evolution? In his book, Mountaineering Essays, John Muir, the father of our national parks, described Cathedral Rock in Yosemite Park with a holy reverence. And here's his description. No feature, however, of all the noble landscape as seen from her seems more wonderful than the cathedral itself, a temple displaying nature's best masonry and sermons in stones. How often I have gazed at it from the tops of hills and ridges and through openings in the forests on my many short excursions, devoutly wondering, admiring, longing. This, I may say, is the first time I have been at church in California, led here at last, every door graciously open for the poor, lonely worshiper. In our best times, everything turns into a religion, All the world seems a church, and the mountains altars. And lo, here at last, in front of the cathedral, is blessed Cassiope, a kind of flower, ringing her thousands of sweet-toned bells, the sweetest church music I ever enjoyed. That's earthly glory, right? And and it's glorious, right? But it's earthly. But it's exchanging, isn't it? The glory of God, the very source of, of the earthly glories that we enjoy. And it's exchanging the creation for the creator and the redeemer. But that is still holiness, even though it's turned its back on God, right? And it's, 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 it's that reverence and that awe, but it's still a manifestation of that, that sense of reverence and awe. You don't have to be a Christian to feel that. Uh, It's when we gaze at mountains and valleys and rivers and lakes and oceans and when we look into the heavens and and astronomy, uh, our feelings of awe, that that what you feel, that is because you are made in the image of God and you need to look to the God who is the creator and the redeemer. That's what, you know, what do I do with these feelings that I have? Whom do I praise and give worship to? And, And the answer is, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the heavens do declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Um, And when you think about the pristine beauties of creation, imagine what the seraphim experience when they gaze upon the source, upon God himself. And when they cry out in verse 3 of our text to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They, they, they are not looking at created glory. They are looking at the very source of glory. And there's a sense in even in which that source of glory, that, that, that holiness of God, there, there still is a, uh, they cannot completely behold and gaze upon the glory of God. John Piper defines the glory of God as the manifest beauty of God's holiness. He says it is the going public of God's holiness. It is the way God puts his holiness on display for people, we might add angels, to apprehend. One of the enjoyments of heaven will be to enjoy the very source. Think of the deepest reverent awe, wonder, feelings that you have ever felt at looking at creation. And it will be infinitely magnified forever and ever to behold the face of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I can't wait. There, there's nothing more to look forward to. Why would you ever turn your back or your face from the law of God and his holiness and his word and from Jesus? To miss that for all of eternity. One of the ways we image God's holiness is our desire to protect and preserve what is holy, glorious, and majestic. We want it forever. You can't have it forever in this fallen, sin-cursed world. You will die. That's why you must look to the death of Jesus. One of the places our family likes to visit, we make a pilgrimage maybe every year, maybe twice a year, is to the YMCA camp on Lake George. And uh, there's a beautiful point on, on the lake, um, at, the, at the camp that goes uh, on Lake George. And, and across the lake is, I, I forget what the, the, the term is, but it's forever wilderness. I, don't, I think it's illegal even to step foot on that side of the lake. And, and, and there, there's this sense that people have, don't they? They want that moment. They want that pristine beauty forever and ever. That's holiness. That's holy land, right? It's, there, God alone is holy, so don't get me on. But you don't have to be a Christian to understand something of glory. It's the image of God that's part of our state law. It's against, the, you can't step foot. You can't build a McDonald's there. And you said to build a McDonald's there, that, that would be like unholy. That would be like sin. Uh, well, imagine sitting against God who is infinitely greater. We're just talking about a piece of land and a bunch of trees and dirt, and, and there are lovely things. So it's, what we see, it's, it's this forever land. Much of New York State is forever wild, I think. Uh, that's very religious. So our laws are very religious, trying to preserve pristine glory and beauty. Several years ago, there was a young woman, Casey Nockett, who went on a graffiti painting spree in seven national parks. So Death Valley, Rocky Mountain National Park, Zion, Yosemite, Crater Lake, and a few others. And she began defiling these, these with her, her graffiti. And then she'd sign these horrible paintings with creepy tings. I don't even know if she can spell creepy things right, but creepy tings. And thousands of people, when they saw this, they signed petitions at the whitehouse.gov site demanding that this person be found and that she pay to the fullest extent of the law. That she received the maximum sentence. She was eventually caught. The maximum sentence she did not receive. But if she were, she would have received seven years of incarceration, seven years of probation, and $700,000 fine. Because she sinned against our national parks. She sinned against this national preservation and heritage. And how do you pay? How do you atone? Not to mention all the money and all the time it took the National Park Services to remove the graffiti. They had to make atonement for that sin also. They had to remove that. How do you make atonement for that? But this is just paint on rocks, isn't it, at the end of the day? But it is still in our nation's holiness. It's a national transgression. But it's infinitely worse to sin against God, who created the heavens and the earth, whose glory fills the earth, and who created you and me, male and female, to reflect and to image his glory in our holiness. When you see pictures of oil spills in the ocean and polluted beaches and turtles eating plastic, what is being appealed to you? That you're being, your holiness is being appealed to. That something about creation, there's been some kind of transgression of a boundary, and someone must make atonement. There must be someone to clean up after that mess. And when Isaiah is brought before the presence of God, his immediate response is how many boundaries he has transgressed before God, who is holy, holy, holy. The prophet's response in verse 5 is, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When a person dies in their sin, their eyes will be opened and they will see the holiness of God. 
and every way that they have transgressed the boundary of his holiness. Every unclean thing that they touched, and we know what it's like to touch things that we shouldn't and the penalty people receive, but when you touch something that's unclean before a holy God who is infinite and eternal, this is Isaiah's reaction, and he was a man of God. And not to have any atonement, not to be able to be covered from the penalty for that sin. You must flee to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The love of God, the Father, in sending his Son to die for the filth of our pollution, the filth of our sins, all of those people, those relationships that we should not have touched, that we should not have thought about, those ways in which we should not have exposed, now we realize that it's before a God who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, who is holy, holy, holy. You must look to the altar. You must look to Jesus, the Lamb of God. There's no more beautiful thing than the holiness of God to a sinner the, the, the sinner flees and runs from the holiness of God to their sin. But if you can't, can't you see something of the beauty of God and his creation and how he has revealed himself? The beauty of Christ, the Redeemer, going to the cross, the nakedness, the forsakenness, not utterly, out of love for you? Would you ever again take the name of God who is holy in vain? Do you think, do you, under, do you realize how hard, my, how deaf my ears have become to hearing God's holy name taken in vain? I don't really think about it like I should. Do you realize that the third commandment says that God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain? Do you love the Lord and his name? We don't take the name of corporations in vain, do we? You can't call your restaurant McDonald's. You'd be breaking federal laws. There are federal trademarks. There are federal patents. You'll be taken to court because of what that name represents and all of its wealth and all of its accomplishments. And the name of God is infinitely and eternally greater. It, the name of Jesus is exalted above every other name. Isn't this what you pray for? Hallowed be thy name. Do you care, brother and sister, about the holy name of God? Do you care? Or has your heart become hardened? Or is it hardening? There's nothing more pristine or pure or glorious or majestic than the name of God and what he has done. And it is, is it of nothing to you? Doesn't it matter when someone else, whom maybe you love, takes the name of the Lord in vain? Just to reach out to them and say, do you realize that God does not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain? Do you understand that? I'm, I'm saying that because I love you. I'm saying that because I take God's name in vain. I'm saying that when I worship God on the Lord's day, his holy day, I, I don't magnify his name as he deserves. I'm, I'm saying this as a sinner redeemed by Christ, but you need those lips. You need the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So may God give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. Let us pray. Lord, our Lord, in all the earth, how majestic is your name. We thank you how you have created us after your own image and how we, we do have a sense and we can begin to understand when we say things like, don't touch my stuff. That's my personal space. Leave it alone. And, and how this, this holiness can become then so turned in of ourselves that we turn our back on you. We thank you, Jesus, that it was in this very context that you took upon yourself flesh and blood. And we thank you that you were born under the law, that you delighted in the law because we did not. And we thank you that you are willing to go to that place as our sin bearer to be forsaken and counted as the worst of sinners. 
We thank you, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, for that love. And I pray that as Isaiah had a sense of his own unholiness as he was in your very heavenly presence, that woe is me. Lord, we live in a world that is still fallen, a still sin-cursed, that is no holier than it was in Isaiah's day. And I pray that you would lead us to cry upon you, Jesus, that you would cleanse us from our, the thoughts, our words, our deeds, the things that we listen to, the things that we take for granted. Will you turn us back to you? Will you give us a growing delight more in you than a delight in the things of creation which are good and which we do delight in, but may we see you as the author of that? And will you give us a growing love for not only your holiness, but who we are now in the Lord Jesus Christ as you have called us to be holy, even as you are holy. Help us to, to hear this as a, a blessed promise that we don't just gaze upon beauty, that you have clothed us with beauty and glory and that we can image and reflect that as the salt of the earth and as the light of the world. Help us to grow more and more in these things and give us opportunities and, and help us as we to, to understand and believe in your holiness and what has been revealed through the prophet Isaiah and what your spirit has impressed upon our hearts that it would lead us to an urgency to those who are still dead in their transgression and sins. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And please turn with me in your Psalters to Psalm 99, the A selection. Let the nations tremble for the Lord is reigning from his throne above the angels. Let the earth be shaken. High above all nations is the Lord, great King in Zion. Let them all praise your name, awesome and majestic, for he is most holy. We have heard of God's holiness in the reading of his word. We have heard the seraphim praise God, who is holy, holy, holy. And this is our opportunity to respond in song as well and to praise God for his holiness. And you'll notice in, as we sing, the holiness of God is mentioned the three times, just like this, Isaiah heard the seraphim, the Lord is most holy. And may we praise and worship him for that. If you're able, please stand and join with me as we sing Psalm 99a.
Please pray with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You are holy and you require for your covenant people to be holy. We thank you for the sermon and the exhortation by Pastor Aaron for us to be holy as you are holy. Lead us by the Holy Spirit to prepare our minds for action and being sober-minded, set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, may we not be condemned to the passions of our former ignorance, but as you who called us are holy, we also should be holy in all our conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Father, you judge impartially according to each one's deeds. Therefore, may we conduct ourselves with fear throughout the time of our exile, knowing that we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but, <clears throat> but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Father, sanctify us by your Spirit that we may work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. May we overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil as you lead us by your Spirit in this fallen world. May we not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind, that by testing we may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Please protect our covenant children as they go out into the world, as the world would like to entice them from the faith instilled in them by their believing parents. The world wishes to catechize them with evil doctrines that are contrary to your holy word. Empower us by your spirit to mortify the flesh, as Paul said to the Colossians, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. May we be sober-minded and watchful as our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. In all circumstances, may we take up the shield of faith with which we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. We pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are spreading the gospel, suffering for the gospel, and imprisoned for the gospel. We pray for their holiness. We pray for them to be set apart from this world as they love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them. We pray for RP Global Missions to establish churches, that would be locally governed, supported, and multiplied to the glory of God alone. We pray for Ben and Teva as they do your will in South Sudan. We pray that they would be loving, bold, and wise in their gospel activities, and that they would be kept from evil, comforted by the Spirit, and encouraged by the body of Christ. We pray the same for all other missionaries and other field workers. May Ben be a good example to the men in his community so that more men would attend worship. We pray for the name of Jesus to be made great among all nations. We pray that the gospel of the kingdom would be pronounced to all peoples. We pray for the Lord of the harvest to raise up and send out more laborers. Father, we lift up to you our, Northern Kore our North Korean brothers and sisters. North Korea is number one on the Open Doors USA World Watch list, indicating that Christians in North Korea are most persecuted. The year 2021, uh, Korean Christians continue to face extreme persecution in every element of their public and private lives. 
through the North Korean authority, those the North Korean authorities claim that COVID-19 has had little impact in the country. North Koreans call it the ghost disease because people are so malnourished already that they die very quickly from COVID-19. Being discovered as a Christian is a death sentence in North Korea. If the believer is not killed instantly, they will be taken to a labor camp as a political criminal. These inhumane prisons have horrific conditions and few believers make it out alive. Everyone in the family will share the same punishment. Kim Jong-un is reported to have expanded the system of prison camps in which an estimated 50 to 70,000 Christians are currently imprisoned. Most Christians in North Korea are unable to meet with other believers and have to keep their faith entirely hidden. There are even stories of husbands and wives not knowing for many years that their spouse was also a Christian. Secret police carry out raids to identify Christians and children are encouraged to tell their teachers about any sign of faith in their parents' home. So, Father, we pray for North Korea's secret believers that you will continue to strengthen them, provide for their needs, and keep them safe. We pray for the believers who are imprisoned. We pray for their comfort and strength, and that even in prison, they would know your presence and love. Father, there have been stories that despite the risk, believers have shared the gospel with others, even in the prison camps. We pray that North Korean believers will shine as lights in the darkest places on earth. Father, we ask that you would bless the work of Open Door Secret Networks in China and give wisdom and discernment to those providing vital aid and fellowship to North Korean believers who are able to make it to Chinese safe houses. Lord Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. The king's heart is a stream of water in your hand, and you turn it wherever you will. We pray that you change the hearts of our leaders so that they will repent of their sins, trust in you for salvation, and bow their knees to you as the king of all nations. We pray that Roe will be overturned or at least ignored by the states, just as the states ignore federal marijuana laws. We pray for the two people whom I shared the gospel with a few days ago, namely my friend Justin and a pro-abortion woman named Jillian. Please remove their hearts of stone and give them hearts of flesh that they may call upon the name of Jesus for salvation. We pray for the salvation of my mom, brothers, and sisters. We pray for Jackie's recovery from her stroke and a second knee surgery that she recently had. We pray for Randy and Coral as they make preparation for moving to Ecuador. Please be with them as they make the transition to living in Ecuador. We pray for the interviews that I have coming up this week. And please bless Rebecca in her job hunting activities. We pray for Greg as he is at urgent care with a possible abscess. We give you thanksgiving for Javon's mom, Maggie, who left the hospital uh, this past Monday. We pray for the Kellys as they have a cold and uh, Mike's dad has a stomach pump. We give thanksgiving for Grace getting local field work. We pray for our Lydia and Nate who are sick. We give thanksgiving for Emma Moore's birthday on Tuesday, my sister's birthday on Wednesday, and my birthday this Saturday. Father, please guide us by your Holy Spirit this week and let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, we pray that we will grow in holiness and be conformed to the image of Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me in your Psalters to Psalm 8, the B selection.
Lord, our Lord, and all the earth, how excellent your name. You above the heavens have set the splendor of your fame. From the mouths of infants young, you the power of praise compose in the face of enemies to stop avenging foes. Please stand and join with me as we praise the excellency of God's name, singing Psalm 8b. Lord, our Lord, in all the earth, how excellent your name. You above the heavens have set the splendor of your fame. From the mouths of infants young, you the power of praise compose in the receive God's blessing. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll close with the singing of Psalm 72G. Psalm 72G, as we pray that God's redemptive glory Uh, would fill the earth just as his glory and creation fills the earth. Psalm 72G.
草。